All right, so this is our uh, second and only lecture in the introduction to gas power cycles for Thermo 1 because they go through the same chapter and plow a lot deeper in Thermo 2 and cover a lot of the enhancements to the Brayton cycle. And I thought I'd get to discuss propulsion systems, but basically instead of trying to turn a shaft in a gas turbine to make work or power out, you would not need that for a propulsion system. You basically put the exhaust products through a nozzle and try to spit them out as high speed as possible. The speed is related to the momentum, linear momentum. You want a high linear momentum flow rate out the back of a jet engine because of high speed. And if you do that, when you do an energy, not a force balance, not an energy balance, force balance around a jet engine where you have the intake, low speed, exhaust, high speed, you get a net thrust, forward thrust, like this. Strap that on the bottom of a wing, and you have a propulsion system that pushes the aircraft down the runway and up into the air. So that's the basics of so that's it for the, you, you, you'll talk more in Thermo 2 about uh, jet engines for propulsion systems. And if, I like to cover also compressible flow effects in propulsion systems. But I don't know, I don't know who's teaching it next semester, what exactly they'll cover. But let's summarize again what we need to know. We need to know about the auto cycle, about the diesel cycle, and about the Brayton cycle. First of all, this models your gasoline engine, your diesel engine, and your automobiles for transportation. This models essentially a gas turbine for electric power production or some shaft power out. Gas turbine in a tank, gas turbine in a large ship, gas turbine in a helicopter, a lot of applications. But this is for a closed a piston and cylinder with a trapped amount of air that's a closed system analysis. The diesel is closed and the Brayton is open system where it's flow through the compressor, flow through the combustor, flow through the turbine and flow through a heat exchanger to close the loop. These are the processes. We've talked about them before. Here's a plot. It helps us recall and visualize the, the process on a PV diagram. So. One to two is isentropic compression. Two to three in the auto is constant volume heat addition. Three to four, isentropic expansion. Four to one, constant volume heat rejection. Look at the diesel cycle. The difference is you have constant pressure heat addition from two to three, not constant volume. And that's part of the expansion. And so they introduce an additional parameter talked about the difference between this volume at three and the volume at two. What's that called? Cutoff ratio. So we have the compression ratio, which is the volume at one divided by the volume at two. Cut, uh, compression ratio for auto, roughly 10. Diesel, roughly 20. And the cutoff ratio is only for the diesel cycle. Okay. Um, what you do is you walk through the first law for each one of these and you'll see that there, for a closed system it's always a change in you, change in internal energy. Okay. The next one is, is sometimes the Q's and the W's are zero. So for process one to two, Q one to two, it's adiabatic compression as well as adiabatic expansion and then constant volume heat addition and constant volume heat rejection. Let's take a look at the diesel, adiabatic, and then only part of that expansion from three to four is, a, whoops, is adiabatic. All right, the work two to three is not equal to zero, it's equal to the integral PDV and when you separate that out and group, throw it onto the other side, you can rewrite the first law for process two to three for the diesel cycle where you have constant pressure heat addition is H3 minus H2. 
it ends up being a difference in enthalpy. Okay. Then the work, 4 to 1, is 0. It's constant volume, heat rejection. For the Brayton cycle, you have what's happening from 1 to 2? What's, what, what's it flowing through? Going from low pressure to high pressure, the pressure ratio, P final over P initial of the or outlet versus the inlet pressure across the, what's the name of the device that goes from one to two, the flow into one and out two for the Brayton cycle? Compressor, yeah. So that's a compressor. Then you go through the combustor, constant pressure, two to three. Then from three to four, what do you flow through? The turbine. And then four back to one, constant pressure heat exchanger to close the loop. So let's take a look. So if, if C stands for the compressor, uh, is Q of the compressor or W of the compressor equal to zero or none of them? Which this is the first law for an open system, a control volume around that compressor. True? Q, it's adiabatic compression. That's our standard assumption. How about the combustor? It's hard to write something, so I put CB, combustor. You know, it's, it's a combustor, okay? Sometimes I put COMB, combustor. But for the first law, open system around the combustor, which one is zero, Q or W? W. There's no shaft power in or out of a combustor. How about for the turbine? Q or W for the turbine? Q, it's adiabatic, just like the compressor is adiabatic. No heat transfer. And then for that heat exchanger to close the loop, which one is? W. So I think that helps. All right. And uh, notice, oh yeah, these are changes in enthalpy for the control volume around each of those components. All right, you ready to solve a problem? Sure. Um, one thing that we do know is that we will use a lot of times these um, very compact and powerful expressions for isentropic processes. So as a review, um, if I have an ideal gas and I have constant specific heats and I have the uh, isotropic process, then the temperature change can be related to the pressure change and K. K is the ratio of specific heats. Or the temperature change to the volume change, or the pressure change to the volume change. So these equations are very handy. We often use these equations in the auto and the diesel. Why do we use those equations in auto diesel? Because we talk about a compression ratio, a volume change in the piston cylinder. And we often use this expression in the Brayton. Why the Brayton? It's a pressure ratio. The pr increase in pressure from inlet to exit across the compressor, it's a pressure ratio. Okay. So here again is the emphasis. There's a pressure low, pressure high. This is the pressure after the compressor and inlet to the turbine. And this is the inlet to the compressor and outlet to the turbine. Okay. Now we're ready to solve a problem. These problems are long. The rest of the class will just solve this problem. That's just the way it is. An air standard Brayton cycle. These are all loaded words. When you see the air standard, there's a lot of assumptions, right? We're going to assume air completely. There's no carbon dioxide and water vapor and combustion products. It behaves as an ideal gas. Okay. It's a Brayton cycle. Right away, we're thinking, aha. Brayton cycle, we have a compressor, we have a combustor, we have a turbine, we have this heat exchanger, and the flow is going between these components. It's going inlet one, two, three, 
four. There's power out of the turbine, but some of that power out of the turbine has to go back and drive the compressor. So the work net is equal to the difference or the sum of the work for the cycle. It says that it's 90 kilopascal and 300 Kelvin at the compressor inlet. So here's the temperature one, 300 K, and the pressure one of 90 kPa. The pressure ratio, not a compression ratio, a pressure ratio. And no many, I don't know how many times when I'm grading a final exam, I'll say, the compressor pressure ratio is 9. Right away. Oh, V2 divided by V1 is 9. Is that correct or wrong? It's wrong. Are you going to make that mistake on the final exam? Should I just, if a student makes that mistake, should I just put a big zero for the whole problem and move on? You're not going to make that mistake, are you? 30 points on one problem, and part A, they blow it right away, and boom. It's like, ah, what do I do with the rest of this? How do I grade it? How do I grade it? <laughs> it's challenging because now I'm looking for how do I give them partial credit? Look how much I got right. Yeah, but there's an equation sheet. All you got to do is start copying equations down. So this is the first 12 problems you got here. These are some really challenging problems that me, poor me has, right? Yeah. You're feeling for me. I see the tears shedding all over the students. It's P2 over P1 is 9. It's the pressure ratio. True? Now you're not going to make that mistake, and you're going to move forward. All right. The, the isentropic efficiency of the compressor is given to be 83%. The maximum temperature is 1,600. What temperature did they just tell us? Did they tell us T1, T2, T3, or T4? T3, that's exactly right. They tell us T3. You just have to know that that's the maximum temperature of the cycle. You've solved enough of these problems. You go back and you look. Where's the maximum temperature? T3. It's outlet of the combustor. That's the hottest of the hot after the, you, you've added all that heat because of combustion. The isotropic efficiency of the turbine is 91%, so the efficiency of the turbine, 0.91. And the basis of a cold air standard analysis, so they tell us, cold. Should I go to the air tables? No, stay away from the air tables. You don't need to go into the air tables. It's cold air analysis, constant specific heats. C sub B and C sub P are given. And how do I get K? I don't see K, professor. Ratio C sub P over C sub B. And when you run that, it's 1.400 or close enough. It's 1.4 for those two values. All right. Now, what is the temperature at the compressor outlet? What are they asking me to solve for for part A? Compressor outlet. It's T2, isn't it? What is the peak pressure? What pressure they ask me to solve for P1, P2, P3, or P4? It, the peak, peak pressure is? P3, which is the same as P2. It's like a trick question. There's no difference between P2 and P3. Let's go back. Right here. Is there a difference between the pressure of P2 and P3? No. You know what? That's such a trick question that guess how I don't have to do any more analysis. I've got P1 is given. P1 was given to be 90 kilopascal. They gave me the ratio of P2 over P1 is 9. I can get partial credit right here and now. I'm ready to go. Part B, I've got it. I don't even have to solve for part A. What is the answer for part B? 9 times 90. Box it and call it quits. Give me some partial credit. At least I got that part right, right? Pardon? Huh? 
That's an eye clicker question, and I don't have it running today. I'm sorry, my processor is getting bogged down when I run it, and I've got to try to use Excel in a minute. So, How about the temperature at the turbine outlet? Hopefully you're taking good notes. Did I encourage you to take good notes? Because I'm going to move to uh, Excel and solve this in Excel. That's the temperature at the turbine outlet. That's T4. How about heat addition in the burner or combustor? It's a different name, burner, combustor. That would be lowercase q in the combustor. CB or COMB, something like that and it's kilojoules of heat added per kilogram of airflow through the combustor. What is the network of the cycle? W net, and I'll just say it's the sum of the W out of the turbine and the W out of the compressor. That's going to be a negative because it's back into the compressor, not out of the compressor. Okay? Okay. Thermal efficiency, the efficiency of the cycle, thermal, is equal to the network divided by what? Heat into the combustor, not Q net, just the Q in the combustor where you had to pay the fuel to burn. And then the back work ratio, that's going to be, well, what fraction or percentage of the work out of the turbine has to be supplied in that shaft back to the compressor. So negative of WC. So I get rid of the negative sign on WC and then I divide by WT which is naturally positive out. Why is there a negative sign? Because I want a positive fraction or positive percentage for the back work ratio. So there's a lot of little things to calculate. We've already solved for one of them. I'd like to do this problem in Excel. So I will just click to Excel and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start solving this problem. This is a Brayton problem, okay? And I'm given P1 and kilopascal. This is my style. And I just say, well, what was the information given? Inlet pressure was 90 kilopascal. Maybe what is the uh, inlet temperature in Kelvin? 300. And then what was the P2 divided by P1? Do you know that they have R in the auto and diesel cycle stands for compression ratio? Is there a simple symbol in this textbook for the pressure ratio when you get to the Brayton cycle? Nope. It's P2 over P1. That's the symbol. So it's not R, but this was 9 for this problem. And then we can come over here, the efficiency of the compressor, the isentropic efficiency is uh, 83%. And the T3, uh, the maximum temperature is 1600 Kelvin. And the efficiency of the turbine is uh, 91%. All right. And then I like to put in the CV and um, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and it's uh, 0 0.718. I don't know why that's a cap. It doesn't need to be a cap. CP, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, 1.005. Uh, what is K? Is that the ratio of C sub P divided by C sub V? It's 1.399. Okay, get the, come over here to home get these digits and move them over a little bit there. So clean up the digits. Sometimes I'll need R, the gas constant. For this, I don't really need it right now, but what are the units on the gas constants? Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That's going to be um, 8.314 divided by the molar mass of air, 28.97. True? Whoops. Um, 8.314 divided by, I need an equal sign, don't I? No, you put a, uh, put a division sign instead of the decimal. 28.97. Will that work? There you go. Then that's the right number, I recall. 0.287 for R if I need it. Okay, so I like to organize that information. Then I like to put things like, what is the state? 
and I'm going to have state one, two, three, four. But you know what? I'm going to think about this for a minute. I'm going to go from state one to two isentropically, then use the efficiency, and then go to two actual. So I might as well put in two S and two actual. Then three is after the combust, uh, um, combustor. Then I'll have four S and four actual. So I might as well put all of those states in right away. Does that make sense? Why I did that? Okay. All right. Let's put in information. Pressure in kilopas kilopascal. State one. Well, they told us it was inlet of 90. So I'll copy that down. Notice, I don't know why that's bold. Let me get rid of bold. Notice that if I change this one to 100, boom, it's updated. That's the beauty of in use of Excel, true? How many people are good at Excel? So what is the pressure at state two? It's the inlet pressure times the pressure ratio. And the state two, the isentropic versus the actual performance of the compressor. By assumption, when you're given the isentropic efficiency, it's the same pressure, isn't it? All right. What about the pressure at state three? It's 810 as well. What about the pressure at 4S? You're back down to 90. And what about the pressure at 4? You're back down to 90. So we got, we have, we're able to calculate all of these pressures right away. Maybe I like a little space in here. Insert a little space. Good. Temperature in Kelvin. And what about that temperature at state one? It was given in the problem statement. Now I say to myself, okay, I need to get the temperature at state 2S, and that's undergoing that, ex that, that, that uh, compression. It's isentropic. It's an ideal gas, constant specific heats. Oh, yeah, I remember that equation that we were going to use. Which equation? This equation right here. So let me do this. I'll just do this a little bit. Go to do a little snipping and grab that. And then come back over to Excel and paste it somewhere. Maybe I'll paste it uh, right up here. Just paste it. There, I re I'm reminding myself of the formula. Okay, so now let's use that formula to calculate the temperature at 2, assuming isotropic compression. Is it equal to the temperature at 1 times that pressure ratio, 9, all to the power of K minus 1 over K? So I can put double parenthesis K minus 1 divided by uh, K and close parenthesis and that should do it. And there's my temperature. Clean up the digits a little bit. 561.9. Let's do this. I like to put on the side, I say, what is the work compressor if I assume isentropic compression? The, act, the work, not actual, but the isentropic work for the compressor. I'll do this calculation. I say, well, isn't it going to be the specific heat constant pressure times the exit minus the inlet temperature? Wouldn't it be 200 and blah, 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 whatever that number is? 263.2 kilojoules of work per kilogram of airflow. But then I remember, oh, we have an isentropic efficiency of 83%. So what is the work compressor actual? Is it going to be that same amount times 83%? Will it be something like 218.4? You divide it by. It's 317. Does it take more work because of irreversibilities to bring it up to the same high pressure? It sure does. It takes more work. 
So that's the actual work. Do you see the difference in the two? And see it's using that efficiency of 83%? Don't mess that up, okay? Right? So it takes more work to compress it up the same pressure ratio. You're still getting it to 810. Okay, well what about that temperature? Well, it's, it's like the delta T across the compressor is the work actual divided by the specific heat constant pressure. So maybe you make DT across the compressor and you say, well, it's the actual work divided by the specific heat constant pressure. So it's going to have a 315.5 K increase. So we know now, oh, the outlet temperature is the inlet plus that delta T. So it actually comes out hotter because of the inefficiencies, the, the isentropic efficiencies less than 100%. It comes out 615 versus 561. That makes sense? Let me try and summarize this on a temperature entropy diagram. For this pro oops, all those answers, you're not supposed to look at them all. We're calculating them slowly, but you can see we just calculated state 2 at 615.5. True? So this is a temperature entropy diagram. This is a line, constant pressure on a temperature entropy diagram. All of that pressure is your 90 kilopascal. This line of constant pressure up here is all the pressure at 810 kilopascal. So if you go constant S from state 1, this is state 1 here, to 2S, it will have not changed the entropy, S, but it will have changed the temperature going from 300 up to 570 or 562, something like that, 562. But if you want, if you have an isotropic inefficiency or efficiency, then it goes up to 2 actual and the actual temperature is 615. Does that make sense? Good. Now let's jump back to Excel. Now, what about this temperature coming out of the combustor? That was part of the given 1600. But now I want to drop back down, and I'll do it in two stages. I'll have the isentropic expansion. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll come over here because I use this K minus 1 divided by K so often. I'll just put in a cell for K minus 1 divided by K, and it just simplifies the Excel formula a little bit. But I'm going to do the same thing. We'll start at 1600 and we'll multiply by 1 over the pressure ratio raised to the power K minus 1 over K. So we're using this same equation right here to calculate the temperature on the outlet of the turbine. Does that make sense to you? So you say, okay, well, what is the work that the turbine produces if it's isentropic expansion? Well, it's C sub P times the inlet minus the exit temperature. You say, oh, I'm given an efficiency, so what's the turbine work actual? Multiply it by the efficiency. That's exactly right. You're going to get less work out, not more. So instead of getting almost 750, you get only 682 kilojoules of work out per kilogram of airflow. So you say, great. What is the dT of the, um, the, the turbine? I should put cap T for temperature of the turbine. Isn't that going to be this amount of work divided by the specific heat constant pressure? And so it's 678.6 degrees. So you take this 1600 and you subtract off that temperature change, and that's the actual temperature out. Notice the actual temperature out is higher. It's 921. 
versus 854. If it was a better turbine, it would be colder coming out. I know it's still hot, but it'd be lower temperature coming out. More work would have been extracted. Let's go ahead and make a table of uh, maybe our Q of the compressor, Q of the combustor, Q of the turbine, Q of the heat exchanger, and put all these over like that. So what about how much heat is uh, coming into the combustor, I mean the compressor, zero. How about how much heat is coming into the turbine, zero. How much heat is coming into the combustor? Is that the specific heat constant pressure times? You're going out at 1600, you came in at 615.5, isn't that the change in enthalpy? So nine, 890, whatever it is, kilojoules per kilogram of airflow. So that's how many kilojoules of heat transfer come into the fluid in the combustor. How about out in the exchanger? Well, I'm going to force a negative sign because we know it's out. We'll have the specific heat times the temperature change. It's going to go in at 921. It'll come back out at 300. Isn't that it? So it's going to be negative 640, blah, blah, blah. So if I want Q net, that's why I wanted a negative sign up there. I just sum this column. All right. So Q net is that. Let's go ahead and calculate the work in the compressor. Hey, we already calculated, didn't we? Isn't it that 317.1? But this is the work underscore compressor. But what I want to do is I want to force that to be negative because I know it's work into the compressor. True? How about the work in the combustor? Zero. How about the work of the turbine? We calculated that. It's right there. How about the work in that heat exchanger? Zero. How about W net? Could I just sum that up? If I sum this up, is it going to equal the Q net? If not, look for where my error is, right? So this is the same. So that's good. Otherwise, but it doesn't look like it should be, but the math works out. It does. That's great. All right. Now, let's do this. Let's go over here and say, I was asked a set of questions. For part A, I was asked to calculate T2 and Kelvin. Well, T2 and Kelvin is right there. So I'm just kind of putting my answers in one place. For part B, what was I asked to solve for? P2 and kilo, kilopascal. Whoop, that was easy. I already knew that one. 810. Part C. And then I always have to fool with this. Control what? Yeah, I don't like that. Uh, every time I got to go in and change the default, I quit. I don't want to copyright nothing, right? Parentheses, C, and then they think you're copywriting something. All right. And so what is T4 actual? Right there. Whoops. How about for part D? Same thing. Nope. Let's take a look. Q in in kilo, kilojoules per kilogram. The Q in is in the combustor, isn't it? How about E? Oh, look at that. They think I'm pounds. Control Z to get rid of that. Okay, work net kilojoules per kilogram. So for every kilogram that goes in a loop, the work net is equal to? 600. So, part F, what is the efficiency 
thermal efficiency. That's just my syntax, efficiency thermal. What is the efficiency equal to? Well, the work net divided by the QN. And I want to put that in parenthesis, percentage and maybe add one more decimal. And then how about for part G? It's the back work ratio. So I know that this has to go back, but I want to get rid of that negative sign. And then I divide it by the work of the turbine. And so the back work ratio is a whopping 46%. And so I can color code and say, here's, here's my answer, box it. And um, I don't know, whoops, don't want that. I want it to do this. Give it a light shade. True? So somebody says, no, it's not uh, 90 kilopascal. It's 100. There you go. It just changed everything. So he says, no, it comes out at 1620 instead of 1600. There you go. True. That's the beauty of it. You can update and change things quickly. By hand. by hand. Yeah, that's exactly right. So sometimes when I'm working a long problem, I'll toggle between by hand and Excel to make sure it's like, why go too far by hand and then find an error if I can't reproduce it in Excel? Uh, that's just me. Maybe some other people do the same. All right. Um, efficiency. Oh, what would, what would happen if I improved the compressor performance? What would happen to things like the thermal efficiency, you know? It would go up. And the backward ratio? Go down. Go down. You, that's good insight. So let's put it at uh, 90%. So it makes those changes. Um, I forgot uh, what our values were. Maybe I'll go backwards. Backwards. Whoops. Backwards. I think this is where we started, right? What about the pressure ratio? Go to 12 pressure ratio. A lot higher backwork ratio, but a little better in thermal efficiency. So anyway, now what I can do is I can plot this. It takes a little bit of tediousness. I'm not good at plotting in Excel for sure. <laughs> but this problem plotted in, in Excel where I set the entropy arbitrary to be 1 at uh, the inlet condition where the pressure and the temperature are 300 Kelvin and the pressure is 90 kilopascal. So it goes and jumps up that temperature if it's isentropic, but it jumps, increases in entropy and it increases in temperature to state two through the compressor because of the irreversibilities. All right. Then you go out this way till 1600 Kelvin. And then if it was isentropic expansion through the turbine, if you have some irreversibilities, you have a higher entropy going out as well as a higher exit temperature going out. And then you have heat rejection all the way back. So there it is on a TS diagram for this problem. One of the beauties is if you do it right, you can come over here. This is where I coded it up and solved it before class. And over here is how I do the plotting, some things over here. But if I really said I want a 15, I don't know, no, maybe not 15, 14 pressure ratio, it'll update it, and it actually updated the plot. So what happens if I really had a 15 pressure ratio, but now I'm going to have a really poor compressor, right? So um, instead of 83%, uh, 60%, and then I take a look at the plot. It doesn't take much. Uh, you have to have a pretty good compressor, otherwise the system's just not going to work. It, it, that's why uh, jet engines and gas turbines were really hard to develop, and they weren't developed until World War II. And uh, how about steam vapor power cycles? You had locomotives and working power cycles because of the very small backwork ratio. 
And so you could have some friction and some irreversibilities and it would still work. Okay. And then how about this one? Let's see how that would look if I really kicked it out, made it, uh, I don't know, 75% isentropic efficiency. Kicks it way out. Okay. What happened? Do I still make power? Ooh, I'm down to less than 10% thermal efficiency. <laughs> and my back work ratio is almost 90%. All the power out of the turbines trying to feed that compressor to make it work and run. Right? So it doesn't take much to break the bank. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have exams where you can use Excel. You have to do it by the old-fashioned paper and pencil. So with that, I'm done for today. Thank you very much.